welcome to our very first Art History Symposium at Angelo State University. Uh, my name is Caroline Kantz, and for those of you who don't know me, I am an assistant professor of art history here at ASU. So today we have organized two uh, really great panels for you all, uh, the first of which is going to feature some of our undergraduate students' research, uh, as well as a paper by a faculty member here at Angelo State. Uh, after just a brief session of a Q&A and then an intermission, and we have some cookies and drinks outside, so please uh, help yourself whenever, uh, we'll have our keynote speaker, doc, uh, Dr. Barbara Kaminska, and she'll be giving her lecture uh, on Goltzius and disability in early modern Netherlandish art. And then from there, we'll just end with a final Q&A and uh, enjoy our weekend. Uh, so, before we get started, I just wanted to thank everyone, um, first off, for being here on a late Friday afternoon. Uh, I know it's late in the semester, so everything is crazy, so I really uh, appreciate you being here uh, and supporting our students. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Edwin Cuenco for his help in designing our uh, lovely poster for the event, and uh, to Jessica Kendrick for all of her assistance in getting this symposium up and running. So, thank you so much. Uh, thanks also to everyone uh, in the department at the Visual and Performing Arts at ASU who are supporting these great academic events throughout the semester. Uh, I'm thrilled that we're able to have this opportunity for our students and faculty to present their research. Uh, and then lastly, thank you so much to RAM TV for recording our event today uh, for those who can't make it in person. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and begin our first panel. And our first speaker today will be Tyler Boaz. So Tyler Boaz is an art generalist currently, currently studying in his fifth year here at ASU and is on course to graduate in this December. Uh, he has devoted himself wholeheartedly to the study and practice of art, both in and out of the university, and has recently had an independent exhibition at the San Angelo Museum of Fine Arts Coop Gallery. His chief interest as a studio artist is the discovery of new artistic techniques by looking to both the past and present. And Tyler is constantly looking to improve the work that he produces and believes that having a solid understanding of the history of art is essential for the successful creation of art in the future, of which I wholeheartedly agree. So please all join me in welcoming Tyler, who will be delivering his paper Deciphering the Lindisfarne Gospels, Carpet Page from the Book of Matthew. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Tyler Boaz, and this is some of the research I did about the the Lindisfarne Gospels, I think it's a very uh, intriguing manuscript, and I hope y'all will agree. Uh, so, uh, among surviving examples of illuminated manuscripts from the medieval world, there exists a great number of artworks to impress, captivate, and intrigue, and also to uh, occasionally confuse and bewilder those who have given who have been given the chance to view and study them. And it is undeniable that many of these uh, illuminated manuscripts that survive today can quite easily be considered exquisitely crafted works of art. And some examples are of such a high quality of craftsmanship and contain artwork so impressively intricate that their illuminator skill and dedication is it is evident even several hundred years after the work's completion. The Lindisfarne Gospels, pictured here, oops, wrong button. Yeah, pictured here, yeah, it's the cover and one of the pages, uh, is one such extraordinary manuscript. Now, the reasons for the Lindisfarne Gospels to be con considered uh, a unique and intriguing manuscript are many and varied. One reason that is particularly worth mentioning is the impressive level of documentation concerning its production and history. 
As a consequence of their medieval origins, it is not at all uncommon for the identity of a manuscript's author to be unknown. And, wait, hold on. Yeah. Uh, and when viewed in comparison to those of even more recent production, such as the equally well-known and admired Book of Kells, the conditions surrounding the creation of the Lindisfarne Gospels is far more certain. This is due in no small part to a colophon, that right here, uh, which bestows credit for the scribing and illumination of the Gospels to the Bishop Edferf of the Lindisfarne Church, after which the manuscript was named. Although the colophon was not described until around 200 years after the manuscript's creation in the 10th century, it is generally accepted to be an accurate record of the Gospel's production. Medieval scholars believe that a priest by the name of Aldred, who may have also been the Bishop of Durham, included this paratext when he translated the words from their original Latin into Old English. The Bishop, Edfer, began to scribe and illuminate the Lindisfarne Gospels sometime around the year 698 CE, or the early 8th century, at his home priory on the island of Lindisfarne, off the coast of Northumbria in northern Britain. The production of these Gospels, which record the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, was most likely an extremely slow-moving and tedious process. Scholars estimate that the project took him somewhere around six to 10 years to complete. And this timeline would not be difficult to understand if we were to take into account not only the large amounts of time and skill that would have been required from Edfirth in order for him to create the extremely complex and intricate designs that are to be found within this manuscript, but also the exceptionally time-consuming process of gathering materials that he would have needed to begin work in the first place. Uh, the skin of sheep, goats, or calves needed to be painstakingly soaked, stretched, dried, scraped, smoothed, cut, and folded in order to create the pages and folios of the manuscript. And minerals and other ingredients would have had to have been gathered up and ground by hand in order to make the pigments and the inks. And quills fashioned from goose feathers had to be continually sharpened and reshaped when they were worn down as a result of them being used for the writing and illuminations. Therefore, it can be reasonably concluded that the production of the Gospels was an expensive and drawn out process as well as a project that at first would have taken quite seriously. Regardless of how long and difficult the process may have been for the bishop, we know that his work on the Gospels did eventually come to an end. And after these texts were completed, the Gospels remained on display and in continuous use at the Priory on the island of Lindisfarne for approximately 100 years. And this time was brought to an end, however, when the island community was sacked by Vikings sometime around the year 793 CE. As a result of the attack, the surviving monks were forced to flee from the island with what little of their possessions they were able to salvage. Fortunately, the Lindisfarne Gospels were among the items that were taken with them. The monks traveled with the manuscript approximately 75 miles to the west of Lindisfarne, where they arrived at a town called Durham, located on the coast, on the coast of Northumbria. It would be at this location that the priest Aldred would eventually write his call upon the manuscript and provide translations of the Latin text into English, into Old English. Uh, this would result in the Lindisfarne Gospels becoming the very first known copy of the four Gospel books to be written in any form of English. Currently, the Lindisfarne Gospels are housed at the British Library in London. And there are several examples of intricate, expressive, or otherwise impressive illuminations that can be found in the Lindisfarne Gospels. Its large, illuminated initials and its depictions of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for example, at the beginning of their respective Gospels. Like, for example, this depiction of uh, Luke. And, 
However, a few of these illuminations that would seem to be particularly worth mentioning would be the meticulously designed carpet pages, these that cover entire uh, pages of the, of the manuscript. And there were five of these, one residing at the beginning of the manuscript, and the other four have been placed before the start of each of the four gospel books directly following the depictions of the evangelists. The second of these expertly illuminated carpet pages is the one that rests before the start of the book of Matthew, and is the one depicted right here. Uh, also my personal favorite. Um, its large, semi-rectangular shape could be seen as serving in the place of a cover for the Gospel book, and the illumination on this page could possibly be seen as a relatively simple one upon a person's first glance on it. However, a closer inspection of its features would most certainly reveal an almost mind-boggling level of complexity in its design that would imply a great level of creativity and technical skill on the person who created it. Uh, the overall shape of this illumination is largely rectangular, you know, just a big rectangular shape, with uh, pointed protrusions that expand outwards towards the four corners of the page. At the center point of each of the rectangle sides, there rests uh, symmetrical abstract shapes that might remind one of an image of an ornately decorated crown, or perhaps a butterfly with its wings spread wide here and here. The entirety of the illumination, with the exception of these shapes, is enclosed in a solid border of a moss green color Although I'll admit here it looks a bit more blue <laughs> on this projector. Um, yeah. Directly inside of this border, there's a banded shape of a crimson red color whose rectangular form would be perfect if it were not for the fact that it branches inward to form five enclosed spaces around here. Right. The center one being of an abstract cruciform design. No. No. This central cross is itself made up of six main shapes, five bell-shaped forms which serve as the horizontal and vertical arms of the cross, and a circular form where they intersect here here. No. Each of these six shapes has a small circular shape at its center, which in turn contains a small cruciform design of its own. The only exception being that of the circular shape across the center, which contains a small design that might remind one of an aerial view of a flower with petals of an alternating blue and red color. See, right here. The space within the large central cross is filled with spiraling interlaced lines of the same two alternating blue and red colors. And the area that one might logically expect to simply be the empty space surrounding the shape of the cross is instead the location of a great deal of visual activity. These areas are occupied by more of these spiraling interlaced designs. And a difference with these, however, would be that they appear to be of an even more densely packed and complex design than those of the ones occupying the interior of the cross. Upon closer inspection, what at first would appear to be merely an assemblage of spiraling lines revealed themselves to actually be the bodies of blue and pink long-necked birds who clasp each other's necks within their beaks. What is more, their blue, red, and gold feathered bodies are intertwining into an hourglass shape that repeats itself in a pattern across the background of the illumination. Each of these elements combine to form the impressive and complex design of this illumination. It would not be difficult to imagine how the Bishop at Firth or the other monks at the Priory at Lindisfarne might have been able to use this carpet page as an aid to their study of the Gospels in this manuscript. 
one might be able to envision what it may have been like for them as they studied the forms on this page and allowed themselves to become lost in its extremely complex and almost labyrinthine design. It has been proposed, in fact, that the practice of doing so may have been able to induce in them a state of mind comparable to that achieved by meditation. And as for a possible meaning for it, perhaps the spiraling forms in the background and the birds violently biting at each other's necks was meant to represent the chaos and evil that would seem to run rampant through this world. Consequently, the viewer may be meant to take comfort in the knowledge that God has shielded them from it through Christ's sacrifice, who is symbolized here by the form of the cross, which appears to hold back the writhing forms in the background and bring order to the chaos. And of course, one would suspect that only the Bishop Edward himself would have known the true purpose and meaning behind this most intriguing illumination. But regardless of the bishop's original intentions for it, it remains true that the carpet page, and indeed the Lindisfarne Gospels as a whole, uh, should be considered to be nothing less than an extremely well-crafted and impressively decorated work of art, and one that is worthy of study and conservation. Thank you very much for listening. Tyler for that excellent talk and thanks to both Tyler and Allie for serving as my guinea pigs uh, for this new project so props to them for uh, reading their very first art history presentation out uh, in front of us all okay so next up is Allie Hustler so Allie is a sophomore, soon to be junior, at Angelo State. Uh, her major is studio art with a concentration in graphic design. In addition to her studio work, Allie has had an interest in art history since she was young. Her favorite subject of research is the Tudor era of England, which she finds the most interesting and intricate when it comes to art. And she'll be speaking about a few of those works today for us. Akin to these interests, her own work as a practicing artist is very portrait-centered, inspired by the Tudor and German painter Hans Holbein himself. Overall, Ali loves painting, drawing, and designing anything she can get her hands on. So we hope that you enjoy Ali's presentation and research paper today, of which she is very passionate about. So let's give a warm round of applause to Ali Hasler, who will be presenting her paper, The Many Faces of Catherine Howard. Um, I need to apologize before I come up here because uh, once I get started on this subject, I literally do not shut up. So, uh, <laughs> and I think Dr. Kons can vouch for me when I say I talk about it a lot. So I was very grateful and excited when she asked um, if anybody wanted to do this and my hand like raised so fast. <laughs> I was like, please let me talk about this. Um, this not including my presentation, but this special interest started in like 2020 in lockdown. I used to watch documentaries for fun. So if that tells you about the person I am, kind of boring, but it's okay. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying thank you. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about Queen Catherine Howard. Um, if you don't know, Henry VIII is probably one of the most notorious kings of England um, to this date, besides Richard III. Um, and before we begin, I must show you who is Catherine Howard. Uh, you probably know of her cousin Anne Boleyn, who is, like I said, one of the most famous queens in history. She has the most infamous story to this day, but not a lot of people talk about her cousin. Um, so Catherine Howard was married to Henry VIII in 1540. Now, we don't know her birth date. We don't even know what month she was born in. All we know is that she was probably around 17 years old, and King Henry was probably 50 years her senior at this point in time. So. Um, and during the Tudor era, this was very common, marrying girls as young as the age of 12 or 11 to be betrothed was very, very common. So for over 500 years, the story of Henry VIII's infamous six wives will probably be the most talked about moments in history. And for some historians, this will never end. 
Although the six wives have their own respective stories to tell, Catherine Howard has been one of the most biggest debates in the history of the Tudors. Her bloodline, how old she was when she met her unfortunately deranged and mentally ill husband, and most importantly, what she looked like. For most women in the Tudor era, it was very hard to make something of yourself if you weren't married into nobility, born of nobility, or a literal princess at, to some extent. For Catherine Howard, like the other four queens before her, she had been a victim to the marriage market and love affairs that soon led to her demise. If you didn't know, men could cheat, but women couldn't. Hypocrisy, right? Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and King Henry was very known for having his love affairs. For Catherine Howard, like the other four queens, um, she was born into a powerful uh, family called the Howards. They were in the Tudor court as the, du uh, the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk at that time. Um, but she was born into a very small branch, so she had no, no nobility, no power, and most importantly, no money. Um, little to nothing is known about her before her marriage to the King of England and was likely around the age of 17 when she was crowned. Before her reign, Catherine stayed with her step-grandmother, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, her step-grandmother. Okay, and um, her step-grandmother was known for not really taking care of the girls who lived there. They were subjected to sexual abuse and grooming and favors through money. Um, because they had almost none. Even though she was a duchess, she was a woman, so she didn't get a ton of funding. Um, and although her past um, around this time um, at her step-grandmother's had been tainted, Catherine had secured a spot as the maid of honor to, Kenry, to Henry's fourth queen, he's four times married at this point, uh, queen's wedding, Anne of Cleves. Here it was that Henry began to notice that the young teen had a surprising youthfulness about her and found her very attractive. Weird, but you know, <laughs> it is what it is, I suppose. Uh, sadly, it would only end a demise as Catherine was beheaded on punishment of adultery to Thomas, Thomas Culpepper, oh my goodness, in 1542, she was 18 years old. Um, and she was the second queen in the entire history of England to be beheaded, and not like Anne Boleyn with a very nice clean sweep with a sword, a blunt axe to her neck. Portraits of the Tudor era were hard, like very sought after for noble women. Obtaining a portrait was a very high sign of status and legacy. If you had a portrait, that means you were in the history books for sure. Um, and in the Tudor court, Henry VIII, now four times divorced, had hired Hans Holbein the Younger as an astounding painter for his Tudor court, and he was known for the almost identicalness of his paintings. If you saw a painting of Hans Holbein, that is most likely what they looked like. He was very good at that. And he had a tendency to destroy these portraits of anybody he didn't like. If Henry wanted something destroyed with a snap of his fingers, it would be gone, and Hans Holbein's work were ultimately burned. After Anne Boleyn, his second wife, was also beheaded, on the remaining, like all the remaining memorials of uh, King Henry and Anne Boleyn uh, were destroyed. Um, and he did everything in his power to make sure his wives did not have any standing in history books. But luckily, Hans Holbein saved his work and made sure that it was protected. The same fate, unfortunately, lies with Catherine, as it is known that Henry gave the same treatment to her memory as he did to Anne's. It is because of this, had Catherine Howard's appearance, age, and even uh, when she was crowned is an extremely debated topic. There is almost little to no information about this and fewer portraits to base it off of. The most known portrait used to display Catherine Howard. Oh, yeah, sorry, I apologize. I forgot to click the thing. Uh, this is Thomas Holbein, the younger self-portraits of himself. And then um, as an example of Hampton Court Palace, some of the memorabilia, such as when Anne Boleyn, he changed everything. He wanted everyone to know that he was marrying Anne Boleyn. But when she died, he ultimately said, you know what, screw you. I don't want anybody to know about you. So um, as you can see, like these tiny little initials on the ceiling of Hampton Court still exist. He failed to ultimately destroy all of them, but they do say A and H for Anne and Henry. And then this is Anne Boleyn's um, falcon, which was her family's crest, um, her crest, as you could say, um, that was found, somehow not destroyed, but it had been taken apart from the wall that it had been mounted on when she was reigning as queen. Um, and so here are some of Catherine's uh, depictions in the media. Probably the most popular is Six, the musical right now. Uh, you probably recognize this, this or some of the music there. Um, although I wouldn't say it's the most accurate depiction of Catherine that we have, it is certainly the most uh, catchy with music. Uh, it's a very great musical. You should check it out. 
Um, and then, of course, the tutors and uh, in defense of Captain Howard, a documentary, and then this is a TV show. I will say the tutors is a little bit, uh, uh, but it is a good watch if you are considering learning about Tudor history. Um, so the most famous portrait that people like to depict Catherine as is this portrait right here, uh, painted by Hans Holbein, oil on canvas. And as you can see, Hans has a very, very delicate pen. He is very careful with how he chooses to represent his um, subject matter. Um, and he is most known too for doing a three-fourths view, which is just you sitting at an angle and kind of looking off to the side as opposed to looking straight at the viewer. Um, and a lot of people have mentioned that her clothing is very expensive, which I do agree, um, that they think this is Catherine Howard due to the time it was painted around um, 15, I'd say 1539, 1541 er area. Um, however, in Latin, uh, you can read up here. I will not be pronouncing it because I cannot speak Latin, but I can tell you what it translates to, and it basically just says age 21. Um, Catherine never reached that age. She was never lucky enough to um, get out of her teens, so unfortunately, um, that is the biggest debunk. A lot of people use this as reference. I don't know why. Please stop. It literally says she's 21 right here. Catherine was never 21. She died at the age of 18. So, um, and the collar on the neck of the woman here, she is wearing a French hood, which was popularized by Anne Boleyn. Uh, even though she is wearing kind of Tudor-esque gowns, this is a 16th century collar, um, late 15th century. Uh, so that is Biggie's debunk. And this is how later, be later to be found that this belonged to, I'm so sorry. It's okay. You know what? Don't worry about it. You know what? No more laser pointer for me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that this belonged to the Cromwell family, which is a very powerful family who could afford this. Um, and this is kind of adjacent to the portrait I mentioned before. However, um, I mean, there is, there is Latin lettering, but it has been eroded away with time. It has been almost 600 years since these were painted. Um, and the brooch, um, I, I don't know if you can see the little face, is um, the Cromwell family crest. So. The likelihood that this is Catherine Howard is extremely unlikely because she was a Howard. Um, the most likely candidate that this is is Elizabeth Seymour, who was the sister to Jane Seymour at the time of England. Um, and she was ultimately Queen of England, but later story, she sur didn't survive, but at least she wasn't beheaded. Um, and then the last two that I like to compare, that these are probably the most likely candidates for Catherine's face. Um, and these were both done by Holbein as well on medallions. These are the most well-preserved uh, portraits that we have. Um, and as you can see, this is probably exactly what Catherine looked like. Um, you can even start to tell by her uh, bodice, which is laced with jewels. Even noble women probably wouldn't be able to afford that expensive jewelry being sewn to their bodice. She's wearing animal fur, which at that time was probably very cold in England, so of course they're going to wear fur. But like I said, that is a extreme luxury that uh, probably only royalty or dukes and duchesses could buy. Um, her French hood is most common, but the most like damning evidence is probably the uh, jewels she's wearing around her neck. These are the queen's jewels. Um, and these were, uh, specifically commissioned by Anne Boleyn with the four pearls, the rubies, and then the brooch in the center that had been passed down from Anne Boleyn down to the rest of the queens. Um, they did belong to Catherine Howard, at, uh, Catherine of Aragon at some point, but Anne Boleyn had them reset out of spite because she hated Catherine. So, um, and then of course you can see here, this is Queen Catherine Parr and Queen Jane Seymour, both wearing these sets of jewelry, uh, just with different brooches that could, could be exchanged out with a hook. And of course, here is an example of Tudor women uh, in nobility and on the right, which is, uh, I guess you could say, uh, lower nobility, poverty almost. Uh, most likely women, uh, of course, we don't have any specific su like superlative evidence of that. All we know is that that is most likely what they would have worn at that time period. And as you can see, the Tudor gown is just completely embellished. You have these giant puffed out sleeves, this animal fur that's extremely expensive. You have the Tudor hood and of course the bodice, which is extremely expensive. And of course that is um, Queen Catherine Parr on the left as well. She is wearing dyed red fabric, which is like 
super duper expensive like really close to purple expensive because like at that time purple was the hardest color to get but you can imagine that it is probably unlikely that Catherine Howard would have been not wearing something like this but the Queen's Jewels is definitely the most damning evidence as far as that goes um, and then we have a on the left this is another Holbein drawing this is the last drawing I will be showing you today on the left, this is a Holbein drawing, and on the right is a restored version of that drawing um, in the 18th century. So on the left, uh, a lot of people have mentioned that this is Anne Boleyn, which is extremely unlikely. Anne was known for, uh, was known for having olive skin, dark eyes, dark hair. She had a hooks for the soul type of look. Um, and Anne Boleyn wasn't particularly pretty either, as they would say. Um, she was more very long, gated face, very long nose. Um, and here, as you can tell, she has more of a Roman nose. She has a much smaller mouth and a shorter face. She has a more rosier complexion as opposed to Anne Boleyn, who had an olive complexion. Um, and um, probably the best part is her eyes. Her eyes are very light. Anne Boleyn's had almost a dark, dark brown to black eyes. Um, and her hair. Her hair uh, was known for being a little bit on the lighter side of Auburn. So the fact that this is, you know, Catherine, it could make a ton of sense, especially with the small little brooch that she's wearing right in the center of that right there. Um, most queens wore something like this on the Day of Sacrament because it was a, at the time, Protestant Catholic country. It was flip-flopping back and forth for like ages I at this point. Um, so um, they would wear something a little bit more um, conservative um, as opposed to showing their shoulders and their collarbone and things like that uh, for the Day of Sacrament such as that. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Allie, for that talk. Uh, so our final speaker of this first panel will be Jessica Kendrick. Uh, Jessica L. Kendrick received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Art History from here, Angela State University and a master's degree in art history and museum and cultural heritage studies from Florida State University. She specializes in the visual cultures of the Americas and pre-Columbian Mesoamerican art and is currently an adjunct instructor here of art at Angela State. Her research interests include indigenous iconography, religious syncretism between Catholicism and indigenous belief systems, body modification practices, matriarchal and feminist representation in indigenous art and ritual practice, archaeoastronomy, and African diasporic tradition in the Americas. Lots of interesting stuff. So uh, please join me in welcoming Jessica, who will be giving her talk today, Microarchitecture of the Zapotec, uh, Physical Manifestations of a Metaphysical Concept. Big words. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming Jessica. Okay, I'm gonna turn, well no, I won't turn that off because I know Barbara needs it. Okay, let me get my set up here. Okay, thank you for that lovely introduction. I think you covered it really, so we'll just go ahead and get started. All right, so during the formative period in Mesoamerica, which lasted from about 1500 BCE to about 300 CE, the Valley of Oaxaca, Mexico underwent an extreme upswing in population, as well as the stratification of that population within a relatively short time span of around 1,000 years. The Rosario phase through Monte Alban period one transition was, according to Blanton et al., one of the most important episodes in the evolution of the cultures that thrived in the Valley of Oaxaca, which occurred between 500 and 400 BCE. The so-called precursor of the ancient Zapotec metropolis of Monte Alban was the site of San Jose Magote. San Jose Magote was one of the oldest sites in the Oaxaca Valley and was the location of many innovations in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. On Mount One, a series of three two-room temple structures known as structures 35, or I'm sorry, 36, 35, and 13 were built superimposed over one another. Okay, so I've put an arrow here. Oh, I didn't bring my laser pointer. Oh, no. That's okay. I got arrows. <laughs> All right, so we've got mound one here. Um, and structure 13 is the, er, is the latest. So that's the one that we see on top here. And I've got an arrow to that one as well. All right. 
So the temple sequence spans almost the entirety of Monte Alban period two, with possible overlap into early Monte Alban period three. First uncovered in 1974, these well-preserved, superimposed temples provide scholars with invaluable information regarding the sanctification and ceremonial rituals performed within them at San Jose Magote and other Zapotec sites. All three temples were constructed of adobe brick with white stuccoed walls and floors and were oriented facing west. So as you can see, they were literally, structure 36 is the oldest here, and then that one was demolished, structure 35 was built on top, then that one was demolished, and then we have structure 13 on top. So they're all kind of stacked on top of each other. All right. An offering of a complex ritual scene known as Feature 96 was buried beneath the floor of the oldest of these temple structures, along with four other offering boxes, and warrants a deeper investigation and particular attention. And that's what we see here. Uh, this ritual scene consists of figures and objects arranged in and around a miniature tomb structure and includes five ceramic effigy urns, a ceramic figure who kneels in a ceramic bowl, the complete skeleton of a bobwhite quail, and a pair of trimmed deer antlers. I would contend that, to better understand how the Zapotec related to both their deceased ancestors and the supernatural forces they revered, this micro-tomb can be interpreted as a literal, physical representation of a metaphysical concept. This recognized separation between both this world and the upper world and between those specialists who communicated with the ancestors and the community at large who relied on their services that was responsible for the two-room temple plan that would later become standardized at Monte Alban and other sites under its control. Okay, so we have this kind of inner-outer dichotomy here um, that's illustrated here really accurately. So there's also this uh, kind of dichotomy that's present within the society of Mesoamerican uh, cultures, okay? So we have this um, this priestly class that is responsible for communicating with the gods. The average person doesn't do that. They're not responsible for that. So they rely on this priestly class to do that for them. Okay, so that's that to kind of kind of clarify that a little bit there. Um, this assertion isn't necessarily a groundbreaking one. However, the current state of the literature fails to tease out much more than a surface level interpretation of this scene where it is mentioned or addressed. Marcus and Flannery discuss it in numerous sources, both collaboratively and on their own, as well as Redmond and Spencer. Selen has also discussed the ceramic vessels known as Cosijo urns by interpreting and analyzing various lines of evidence through a cosmological framework. Uh, we can come to better understand the ways in which the Zapotec related to their ancestors and revered supernaturals, as well as how different communities related to one another, and how we can possibly better interpret Zapotec ritual and its functions in larger society. The tomb structure of the ritual scene of Feature 96 could be considered an example of Zapotec microarchitecture. In a 1976 article, Boucher discusses microarchitecture within the context of the Gothic style of the medieval period and claims that small scale architectural structures like reliquaries were more relatable and more imperative to the general population and their salvation than their grand monumental sized counterparts. Boucher makes sure to note the often undervalued importance of the group experience to believers when linked to objects imbued with mythical importance. There is also an analogy between his description of the eventual role of the church as a service structure meant to house the smaller micro versions and the Zapotec temple where the offering box containing feature 96 was found. Hold on, I gotta scroll down one second. Okay. Suggesting that these small sacred objects can be analyzed in much the same way as their macro brethren, Boucher emphasizes the blurring of lines that occurred between the creation of the macro and the micro. After all, the small-scale model is often created with at least the same artistry to be used in the larger final version. Beginning in the late 13th century, the same design ideals were applied to the creation of both until the design utilized in the smaller format became so complex as to warrant its own genre entirely. And while the Zapotec example of a micro-tomb was never intended to be seen by more than a few select individuals before burial, the motivation for its creation and placement are comparable to some of the motivations discussed by Boucher. The way that the Zapotec would have related to the imagery represented by and in this scene would have been comparable to the audience of Boucher's objects. And in the same way that Boucher observes that the greatest mysteries of Christianity were enclosed in these Gothic microstructures, the mysteries of the ancient Zapotec are embodied by this scene. 
It is interesting to note that this example of a Zapotec microtomb is similar to an older macro example known as Tomb 11 found at San Jose Magote. Uh, and that one is shown here with a schematic of uh, Tomb 11 next to it. All right. And I would argue uh, that this could indicate that the microtomb of feature 96 is meant to represent the tomb of a long deceased ancestor who was the progenitor of, or a very important member of, the ruling elite's dynasty. This ancestor is the one depicted atop the microtomb, who, according to Marcus and Flannery, is in mid-transformation into one of the revered cloud ancestors. Uh, and that's, I don't have the pointer, but that's that guy on top, right? The, the one who looks like he's flying, that guy. So in this paper, I argue that this dichotomy of upper and lower and inner and outer is observable in the ritual scene of feature 96, which was buried under the floor of structure 36 a two-room temple dating to Monte Alban, period two, at San Jose Magote. Recently radiocarbon dated to 60 BCE to 90 CE, Structure, structure 36 was the first two-room temple in a series of three that were superimposed upon one another. Before the next two-room temple, Structure 35, was built over the raised remains of Structure 36, sometime between 10 BCE and 140 CE, a total of five offering boxes were deposited underneath the floor of Structure 36. In about another hundred years, Structure 35 was covered, and a final temple, Structure 13, was built over it, approximately 100 to 200 CE. In their 2004 article, Marcus and Flannery proposed the idea that the ritual raising and rebuilding of these two-room temples at San Jose Magote coincides with a 52-year calendar cycle. The later Aztec culture are also known for their use of a 52-year cycle, believing that the world would end unless all old fires were extinguished and new fires lit, both in the main temple and on the surrounding mountaintops at the end of every cycle. While Marcus and Flannery make sure to note that we have no knowledge of what rites were conducted upon cycles end, they are also quick to emphasize the Zapotec tendency of building new temples over the remains of leveled ones. Redmond and Spencer also discussed this possibility in their 2008 article for Cambridge Archaeological Journal. The offering box containing feature 96 was deposited underneath the floor of structure 35 along with four other boxes before it was covered with a layer of soft adobe debris. This layer of debris preserved the temple as well as a large number of obsidian implements found scattered on the southern end of the floor, which we can see here laid out. Uh, these implements included daggers and prismatic blades known to be used for bloodletting rituals and sacrificing small animals such as birds. And if we remember, um, if we go back to this, there's a bobwhite quail skeleton, remember, and we have this artist's rendering where it shows the bird inside the microtomb. Um, so access to the, inner, the temple's inner room, uh, the inner room, sorry, was generally restricted to, to the religious specialists who would take the offerings left by petitioners in the outer room to complete the offering or sacrifice in the more sacred inner room. So here's that inner outer dichotomy once again presenting itself, right? Um, via the priests having to perform those rituals. Uh, Flannery and Marcus argue that the standardization of the two-room temple plan indicates the implementation of a state religion facilitated by specialized priests that would endure through the classic and historic periods. The addition of a second room to the Zapotec temple plan was observably in place by Monte Alban period two, and one of the best known examples was uncovered by Caso on building 10, uh, located northeast of Monte Alban's main plaza. And we have a plan of that one here in figure eight. Uh, Acosta uncovered another earlier temple underneath Caso's discovery, so some more superimposed temples here. And there was also an offering box deposited beneath the floor of this temple, presumably before the later one was built over it, as observed at San Jose Magote. Uh, an early example of the two-room temple type was discovered at Cerro Tilcajete in the Valley Grande arm of the Oaxaca Valley, uh, shown here in figure nine. And Blanton has suggested that Monte Alban was founded without regard to practical economic matters or subsistence. Therefore, uh, secondary centers like San Jose Magote and Cerro Tilcajete are all the more important uh, to Monte Alban's empire. All right. Marcus and Flannery have interpreted the complex scene of Feature 96 as representing a deceased Zapotec lord transforming into a cloud person or flying figure who can now communicate with lightning. 
Additionally, they assert that the scene could represent a royal ancestor of the kneeling figure within the miniature tomb, or the partial metamorphosis of that same individual, caught in a stage where its body is still that of a human, but the face is that of the lightning god Cosillo. A cape flows behind the figure, who sits up on its elbows, holding a wooden stick and a bifurcated object that Marcus and Flannery identify as a serpent tongue. And they link these implements uh, to the prol proliferation of agriculture. Selen has studied these Cosijo urns well, voicing support for the links drawn between Cosijo as a revered supernatural and the ancient Mesoamerican rain god Tlaloc by Caso and Bernal. Marcus and Flannery have interpreted uh, the four Cosijo urns of feature 96 as the four companions of Cosijo, the lightning god, uh, which include rain, wind, clouds, and hail, which we see in figure 10 here. Uh, the inclusion of these four accompanying supernatural forces has precedence in Oaxaca as observable in a Zapotec effigy vessel of Cosijo with four containers attached behind the effigy figure, uh, which is figure 11 here on the right. Every aspect of the ritual scene known as feature 96 was predetermined and carefully arranged. The motivation behind the deposition of the five offering boxes found under the floor of structure 36 may never be known with any amount of certainty, but the possible interpretations put forth by Zapotec scholars help us better understand the nature of the society that lived at San Jose Magote and how they interacted with Monte Alban, as well as how the Zapotec ritually related to the ancestors and their memory. If the temples included in the superimposed sequence were in fact ritually raised at the end of cycle, then it would indicate a ritual rededication, or could indicate a ritual rededication, to stay in the favor of the supernaturals that they revered. These supernaturals and the ancestors who would placate them on behalf of their still living family members were responsible for bringing fertilities to crops and people. If San Jose Magote and Cerro Ticajete were secondary centers to Monte Alban and supplied this capital with food and other items, then making sure that these sites were in good standing with these supernaturals would have been of primary importance to the ruling elite. This connection is emphasized by the similarities, of, of, sorry, similarities observable <laughs> between the capital and these secondary centers, but especially between Monte Alban and San Jose Magote, where the two-room temple plan prevails. The inclusion of symbolic red color pigment is generally associated with elite ancestor ritual and it can be seen at San Jose Magote, Monte Alban, and even the Olmec sites of San Lorenzo and La Venta as well as throughout Mesoamerica. Spatial distinction of ritually accessible space is illustrated in the two-room temple plan as well as the example of microarchitecture from San Jose Magote known as Feature 96. The less sacred outer temple is the equivalent of the interior of the microtomb where the ancestor figure, also identified as the uncompagnante figure or companion figure, who is covered in red pigment, kneels in a bowl beside the remains of a bob white quail offering. Inside this microtomb is literally where the ancestor's representative was placed and buried to be housed forever. Outside and atop the microtomb represents the upper realm of existence where the turtle-like ancestors reside among the clouds. Ascension into this upper realm may have required a human to turtle ancestor transformation, which is depicted in the flying ancestor figure shown wearing a Cosijo mask known as Vessel 5. Um, and this was found on a, a, a stucco carving on, to, on a tomb in Yashila. That's where we found this drawing here. Uh, the tortoise-like feet of the carved figure uh, as well as the figures posing, emphasize this turtle-tortoise link and seems to be present in many native cultures of North America. Tortoises and turtles are usually very primordial, highly revered creatures in the realm of supernaturals, and in the Zapotec case, they are associated with the ancestors. Another link is present in the inclusion of the trimmed antlers, which could have been used to beat a turtle drum. The slab walls of the microtomb represent the physical and spiritual barrier between the living and the realm of the supernaturals as perceived by the Zapotec. The divide between the inner and outer rooms of the two-room temple plan also represents the barrier represented by the slab walls and the roof of the microtomb. Under the floor of the temple's inner room is where the most impressive offerings of features 94 and 96 were left. And we can see those, I've outlined them in red here. Feature 94 uh, was deposited in a stone offering box under the northwest end of the floor of the inner room 
and consisted of two human effigies of jade and other small fragments lying in red, sorry, red pigmented powder. These two figures have been interpreted by Marcus and Flannery as possibly being stand-ins for sacrificed nobles. And I was able to find a nice color version of the larger figure here and include that, which is a nice surprise. <laughs> uh, feature 96 was deposited along the center of the back wall of the inner room in an adobe offering box as opposed to stone and contained the complex ritual scene arranged around the adobe walled microtomb that this paper has been considering. It is worth noting once again that the Uncompagnante figure found <sighs> kneeling in a bowl inside the microtomb is covered in red powder. This recurring red pigment indicates an intricate link between these offerings and the revered cloud ancestors. This paper explored the physical manifestations of a metaphysical concept recognized by the Zapotec that revolved around the identified separation between the revered supernaturals and the living through the lens of Boucher's theories of microarchitecture and the analysis of feature 96 found at San Jose Magote. Due to the separation between the physical and metaphysical, communication with the supernaturals and or deified ancestors had to be facilitated by full-time religious specialists. The incorporation of these full-time specialists prompted the addition of the second room to the Zapotec temple that would become standardized later at Monte Alban and other sites under its control. I hope that my analysis can shed light on the cosmological principles that the Zapotec lived by as well as how they related to, memorialized, and paid tribute to their revere, revered supernaturals and ancestors. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I think we have a, a little bit of time for a Q&A. So uh, I just asked for everyone who was in our first panel, if we could just come up to the stage. Uh, I think we could just like keep it casual and just like sit right here on the stage, why not? Uh, <laughs> uh, we have about, I don't know, five minutes or so for questions and then we'll, we'll take a break um, and have intermission. There are cookies and coffee and whatnot outside. Um, but first off, uh, I'll let everyone get up here first before I open the, the room. Thank you. Uh, any questions for any of our speakers? And uh, feel free uh, if you have any um, I don't know, any comments? Want to hear more about their research? I'm a yapper, so if you ask me anything, I'll probably give the answer to you. <laughs> like, what shoes she wore. I got you, don't even worry. <laughs> it's in a tab on my phone, actually. <laughs> She's like, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> 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 shoes? Any shoes? What were the shoes like? The shoes were, were heels, but like most of the time, they didn't have straps on the back. They were like, those like sandal heels almost and they were most likely pointed it was just that was the very like fashionable like because it made you taller as well as to not drag your dress on the floor but if you were not noble you probably went barefoot a lot of the time and or wore sandals that were had like leather some yeah yeah the, the jesus stand sandals still existed during that time period they did not let those go for a hot minute like again, new fashion trends people, we get it. Any other questions? Yeah, well, for Jessica. So the, is that a bowl that that uh, figure is sitting in? Yes. And so was there a liquid in there, or what was the symbolic nature of the bowl? That's a good question. I mean, I suppose originally there could have been liquid that maybe just evaporated. Um, I'd have to look at the archeological report to see if they found any like evidence that there was liquid in it at some point. Um, by uh, that, I'm not quite sure of. But there was red pigment. They found a lot of red pigment covering this figure. Um, and that, they think, is indicative that this could be a stand-in for a sacrificed individual. Um, so that red pigment is something that we find kind of consistently um, among the cultures of Mesoamerica. When we find figures like this that are sometimes um, buried in some sort of ritual capacity, um, and our interpretation has been that that is kind of indicative that that figure was placed there um, as a substitute for some sort of like living sacrifice. Um, but I don't know for sure about the liquid. There, there could have been. It's also, um, do you know anything more about the flying uh, ancestors? Um, maybe. What are you curious Just about? To elaborate on maybe the mythology of that. Yeah. So, so the idea is that once you um, 
you once you pass away, you become one of the the deified ancestors, like um, you, and you kind of transform into a turtle. Is kind of the idea, which I find very cool, right? Um, yeah, this idea that uh, you become one of the turtle ancestors. It's kind of brilliant. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of neat, huh? Yeah. Yeah, Chrissy. I, uh, the last in your introduction, you said that you um, thought about the past in order to come up with new methods in your practice, and I was wondering if the windstorm gospel has had any effect on your artistic practice. A bit, you know, I think, I think I'm, I'm influenced by most things that I see. Uh, I've always been very interested in how things, maybe from different areas of, of studying different areas of art could be combined and how they could, uh, how they could be transformed. Um, it's, it's funny, because right after I, I had written this, I was, I was putting together my, uh, my, my, my gallery at the, at the Coop, and that was, a, that was a black light gallery, and I had a bunch of neon paints, and I really liked the, the bright colors that were present in this, in this particular manuscript, and this sort of uh, just very bold lines and whatnot, and, and I can't say it didn't influence me. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Catherine, first, she is painted in history as a sex monger. Um, she was a teenager. Uh, a lot of the women, especially with women like Anne Boleyn, the charges made against them were incredibly false. There were no signs of adultery. There were no signs of any cheating. Um, Henry just wanted an excuse, especially from the Pope, to get rid of his wife so he could marry another because he was angry that he didn't have a son. Um, with Catherine, um, there were signs of adultery with her. However, um, in that time period, you know, age doesn't matter, but when we look at it, it's like she was like, what, 17? And he was like almost 60. It's like at the same time, and uh, you can't deny that Henry also had several affairs um, in desperation to have a son because he was convinced that that was the reason. Like the, the women were the reason why he wasn't having sons. Like, Shocker to believe, men decide the gender. Um, but Catherine specifically, not only did she get like the worst treatment to a Tudor queen I have ever seen, ever, um, she is also just incredibly misinterpreted in history. Um, Anne Boleyn, Henry was generous enough to not only delay her execution, but to find a French swordsman to behead her. Um, whereas Catherine Howard was locked in a prison cell and beheaded by an axe. Um, there are some sources that say it took two blows, um, so like hit her shoulders and then beheaded her, which is very, very painful. Um, but of course, like, she's just incredibly misinterpreted. She was sexually abused as a kid, and she was not taken care of the way she should have. She was taken from a very, very low point in her life and thrown into being a queen. She had never done that before. She had not even known what to do as a noble woman. So she was very, very ignorant to sad society. And so I feel like she just got treated so horribly in that sense. And she was a kid, she was a literal child. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, I guess a little fun fact too is that she was so distraught over that sentencing that she had the block that she would be beheaded on brought to her chambers and she practiced laying her head on it, if that tells you anything. There was like literal psychosis there, like she was just was not prepared for anything she was thrown into. So that's why, mainly. And just because there's no real art of her, um, you know, Anne Boleyn is viewed as this, you know, she, she didn't do anything wrong, she was no adulteress, you know, she gets all the praise in the world for being this super powerful woman, but what about Catherine, who also got the same demise, but was not nearly as kind to her throughout history? So that's probably why I chose her specifically, if anyway. Okay. That was a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got time for one more question, so okay, please. So it's also for you, because I, um, a, little, a little earlier than that, medieval period, but. Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate on the significance of an execution by sword and kind of the symbology behind that? Yeah, for sure. It was a sign of his last form of care. Um, 
because originally Anne was supposed to be beheaded by an axe, like many. Um, the sword is, in comparison to an axe, is extremely clean. Um, at the time, the craftsmanship of the French was very, like, like very highly anointed. Um, and with a sword, you know, that flat blade can just cut through anything, um, even armor at that point. So that craftsmanship, that saying, like, you will feel no pain, um, you know, it'll be quick, it'll be instant. Um, the words of her bishop when Anne was locked in the tower were, my lady, you will feel no pain. And she said, yes, I know the executioner is very good. And so Henry doing that, saying, I will kill you, with, which is really odd, by the way, like, I'll kill you with a sword instead of an axe. It's like, okay, well, I'm still dying anyway, so it's like, whatever. But that was his way of saying, I still care about you enough to make sure you feel no pain. Um, that was his way of saying, like, that was the most noble way he could have given a goodbye to somebody. Um, still dying, but the sword is like, and he, he had paid the French executioner to, to travel all the way from France. So it was kind of sim symbolical in a way of like, you know, um, I care about you enough to die in a very noble way, if that makes sense. Um, as a Tudor queen should have died very, very highly. Um, the axe most of the time was just on recorded very being a very messy job. Those executioners were just not doing a good job. Um, for example, Mary Stewart, it actually struck her shoulder blades um, and then he had to put his foot on her back to dig it out and then he finally cut her. So that's why it's like using an ax versus a sword. It's like, here, I'm gonna give you a sword so you don't have to die as badly as the other people, if that makes sense. If I may add to that. Yeah. Another kind of more symbolic aspect to being killed with a sword, unlike an axe where you're going to put the person's head on the block and mm -hmm. slaughter them like an animal, a sword can be swung sideways, yes. which is easier. So you actually get to die upright on your knees. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there's actually a painting of this execution where yes. she has her hand folded as if in prayer. So just to add that. And died in a very noble way. Um, standing upright was also a way of for them to give last prayers. Um, and was like, from what we understand was mumbling Protestant um, verses in English when she had died. Um, the block, like you said, very messy. It's very blunt, you know, like you're right in front of that crowd. Can you imagine being at the forefront of that? Like right in front of a block with a haystack? Like gross, like that's disgusting. Um, and like you said, standing upright, she was also blindfolded. Uh, people who died to an ax were not blindfolded. They were actually, um, they had to have their arms pulled out to the side to be held out by people because a lot of people would just hug the block out of fear. Um, and for Anne, she was known to go up there. She did it with extreme dignity, and she said, you know, I hold no grudges against the king, which you should have, girl. Like, you're about to die. At least, at least, like, be mean to this man before you go. Like, hello? Could not be me. But, um, like, like you said, very symbolic. She got on her knees, um, you know, they blindfolded her, they took off her headdress for her, which was also not a big thing. They normally just let them die in the clothes that they came in. And he hid the sword underneath the hay, and he said, boy, fetch my sword. Her head turned that way to where the sound was, where he was yelling, and he took it from behind her and he struck her. And so Anne's execution was probably the most dignified execution, for sure. And I totally agree with you, like, standing upright. She was also holding a rosary in her hand when she died, so that was also very symbolic. Considering the fact she couldn't see, I was like, hey girl, I mean, if you want to talk good about your man, ex-man, that's fine. But me personally, I'd be like, man, screw you, whatever. I'm going to die to a sword, whatever, you know? <laughs> Sorry about that. That was a lot. Oh, no, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think we'll go ahead and take like a brief break and get back here uh, right around 4.15, maybe a minute or two after. Uh, can we just uh, give one more round of applause to this first panel? We did an excellent job. symposium so we'll be switching gears now and welcoming our last uh, speaker of the day um, professor Barbara Kaminska so dr. Barbara A. Kaminska is an associate professor of art history at Sam Houston State University 
she's the author of two books, uh, one of which is Peter Bruegel, The Elder, Religious Art for the Urban Community, which was published in, with Brill in 2019, as well as another book from 2019, also published with Brill, no, 2021, my apologies, and that's um, Images of Miraculous Healing in Early Modern Netherlands. Barbara's also published on interconfessional uh, networks and histories of hospitality in Northern Europe. Her current projects focus on early modern disability, uh, lived experiences of pain, and sensory impairments, a bit of which we'll get to hear about today. I'm very excited. Uh, her essay, Mute Painting, Deafness and Speechlessness in the Theory and Historiography of Dutch Art, was published earlier this spring in open access in the Journal of Historians of Netherlandish Art. Kaminska has also had her work published in a number of journals, such as the 16th Century Journal, the Journal of the National Museum in Warsaw, Explorations in Renaissance Culture, the Journal of Early Modern Christianity, and Renaissance and Reformation, to name a few. Uh, beyond her long and impressive list of publications, Dr. Kaminska has received several awards, including a fellowship from the historians of Netherlandish art. She was awarded the Albert W. Fields Annual Award from the South Central Renaissance for her best article published in Explorations in Renaissance Culture. Alongside her excellent record as a researcher, Dr. Kaminska has worked at Sam Houston State since the fall of 2016, where she's taught survey and upper level art history courses in the Department of Art and Design alongside a number of courses for the Honors College. It's my great pleasure now to welcome my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Barbara A. Kaminska to the stage where she'll be presenting her paper, Goldsius's Hand, Disability and Artistic Genius in Early Modern Europe. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kaminska. Thank you, thank you for this very generous introduction. And I also wanted to thank the Portons for inviting me to this um, excellent symposium. It was really lovely to hear our three first very passionate speakers in the first session. And thank you all for spending the for spending this Friday afternoon um, late in the semester with us. In 1604, <clears throat> a Dutch painter and writer, Karl van Mander described the childhood accident of his friend and fellow artist, Henrik Holtius, in the following quotes. Holtius was so attracted to fire that when he was a year or so old and could walk by himself, he fell into the fire with his face over a pan of boiling oil and burned both his hands in the red hot coals, which his mother carefully tied to heal with splints, ointments, and other things, and he was in much pain day and night until a no old female neighbor removed the splint, saying that she could do better. She then bound only the right hand in a cloth, on account of which the tendons of that hand grew together, with the consequence that throughout his life he could never completely open that hand. Now what follows is a biography of a great artist, an ingenious draftsman, excellent engraver, and innovative painter whose works combined different techniques and whose inventive compositions surpassed works of all other Netherlandish masters. In other words, in Karl van Mander's Hilbert book, which is often translated as the book on picturing, Henry Holtius is the northern Michelangelo. While the accident and the incompetent treatment administered by the neighbor caused a partial loss of function and disfigurement of Holtius's right hand, through stubborn exercise, Holtius became ambidextrous, and he would normally draw and paint with his left hand, and he would engrave with his right hand, so the hand which was damaged. Thus, in Van Mander's telling, Holtius was transformed from a hapless toddler into an artist in control of every line he drew, engraved, and painted. And so, in the foundational historiographic and theoretical text of Northern Renaissance, Disability is framed as a springboard of artistic creation. And conversely, artistic creation serves to, quote unquote, overcome disability. Karl van Mander's biography of Holtius might be the most famous early modern example of the convergence of disability and artistic genius. But it is not the only one. For centuries, chronic illness, 
impact and sensory and, and physical disabilities have been linked to heightened creative and intellectual prowess, both in real life and fictional examples. Stephen Hawking's mother considered the power of his mind to compensate for the limitations of his body after his ALS diagnosis, and Stevie Wonder has often suggested that his musical talent blossomed thanks to his visual impairment. In the Marvel Universe, superhero Daredevil enjoys enhanced sensory perception, which he acquired following his loss of physical vision. In today's talk, I will discuss the so-called compensation theory on the example of 16th and 17th century artists and their biographies, and suggest how it continues to inform contemporary scholarship and curatorial practices. I will also consider how this narrative, which associates disability with artistic genius, counters the emotions of fear, disgust, and pity that are commonly identified as reactions that early modern people experienced and expressed when confronted with disability and chronic, and chronic illness. Early modern and contemporary examples of disabled individuals who overcome their disability and accomplish extraordinary things have their ancient predecessors. Likewise, real life and fictional. In Homer's Odyssey, the blind Tiresias, deprived of physical vision, became a prophet and could see the future. The god of metalwork and fire, Hephaestus, walked with a limp and lacked in beauty that characterized other gods and goddesses. In some versions of Hephaestus' story, these physical defects caused his exile from the Mount Olympus. To compensate for his disability and ugliness, Hephaestus received the gifts of ambidexterity, extraordinary metallurgic skills, and most notably, the power to give life to sculptures which he created in his forge. Hephaestus' ability to use both his right and left hand with equal strength and precision and his association with fire establishes him as a mythological prefiguration of Henrik Holtius, whose life, career, and performance of disability I would like to focus on for the next several minutes. Now, if we try to imagine little Henrik's accident, we can picture a child falling face first into a pan, then almost immediately lifting himself up by his hands to escape that hot oil. This would likely have caused more damage to the palm than the dorsum of his hands. Van Manner also tells us that Hendrik fell into the fire with his face over a pan of boiling oil. Now, when you think about it, oil burns, especially to the more sensitive skin of the face, not to mention the skin of a one-year-old child, would typically be more severe than burns on the hands caused by hot coals. And yet, Van Mother never mentions any disfigurement of Holtius' face, nor do we see any scarring in his self-portraits or portraits of him by other artists. So in the construction of Holtius' identity as an artist, his hands, particularly his damaged right hand, are of far greater importance. Now, if the hand was badly burned and deformed in the accident itself, according to Van Mander, the permanent damage to the tendons and nerves was caused by the, by the incompetent treatment administered by a now old female neighbor. The splints and ointments used by Holtius' mother on both hands did not seem to have had any adverse effects, although understandably, the child suffered considerable pain. By the time the neighbor offered her assistance, the less badly burned left hand must have healed enough not to require any further treatment. However, the removal of splints, which if properly used, can indeed help to prevent contractures and tissue destruction in burn victims, and their replacement with tightly wrapped cloth significantly contributed to the lifelong impairment and deformity. But the question here is why is Van Mander so stubborn about casting the blame on the local wise woman? What is Van Mander's agenda here? Now, the book on picturing was published at a time when medicine was becoming a regulated profession. One could not practice without a guild membership, um, and university-trained physicians and surgeons warned naive patients about quacks. 
While the initial treatment administered by the mother can be understood as an instinctive loving reaction to her young child's pain, the neighbor's meddling signifies gendered medical ignorance. Within this paradigmatic narrative, female ignorance causes Holtius's impairment, and it takes male genius and perseverance to overcome it. Now, if we distance ourselves from Farrell van Mander's narrative, um, the damage to Holtius's hand likely helped him to become a better engraver for a very simple reason. And in engraving, you incise lines, you cut lines directly into a metal plate, which is a very, very hard thing to do. Um, and you actually have to engage your forearm and your wrist, as opposed to your fingers only, um, to be a good engraver. And because Holtius could not, um, because his hand was not fully fun functional, he had to engage his forearm and his wrist more than a non-disabled individual. Holtius created several works in which he focused on his deformed um, hand, such as this drawing of um, his hand in four different positions, as well as the self-portrait I showed you earlier where we see the scarring of his hand very well. Um, the most striking, however, among them is a drawing from 1588 which registers the actual damage to the hand consistent with what we know, with what is known about the accident. A line of indentation runs across the dorsum of the whole hand. The nail bed of the middle finger is caved in. The phalanges of the index finger are bent and distorted. And the damaged muscles um, around the wrist are unnaturally bulbous. The palm of the hand, never depicted by Holtzius, must have been affected the most by accident, by the accident. But there is also evidence of scarring and contractures between the thumb and the index finger, below the ring finger, and toward the little finger. So around this area here. The drawing status is perplexing, as it's suspended between an artist's self-portrait and a medical specimen of the kind that we begin to see illustrated in the mid 16th century. But it does not conform to either genre. It invites inquisitive looking that relies on curiosity as a precondition of knowledge. Um, but the depicted hands anomalies can quickly transform this laudable quest for visual knowledge into a visual vice. In the end, we are not sure what we are supposed to feel when looking at the drawing, or even how long are we supposed to look at it. Holtius leaves us with several questions as he forces us to consider our reactions to deformity and impairment. Does the image require prolonged scrutiny in the name of appreciation of the artist's craft, or should we avert our gaze before our morbid curiosity transforms Holtius's hand into a minor display of freakery? And if we look away, does this mean that we are disgusted by Holtius's unorthodox anatomy? In addition to Holtius, Karl van Mander mentions three other artists with disabilities in his book on picturing. Among them stands out Reichardt Arts, whose short biography deserves our attention as it adds to the history of <coughs> emotions associated with disability. It also bolsters the connection between disability and visual arts as means of its overcoming, and helps us better understand some aspects of Holtius's life. In his youth, Reichardt um, burned his leg, which had to be amputated after unsuccessful treatment. A son of a fisherman from Weikanze, which you have on the map here, Reichardt was no longer fit to take up his father's profession and Van Mander tells us that he often sat by fire, which in Van Mander is associated with quietness, lack of activity, and melancholy, a complex psychosomatic state that can be approximated in modern language as depression. Reichardt's depression after his accident is a commonly expected reaction to a new disability, but a reaction which Reichardt was able to transcend thanks to art. It was during Reichardt's contemplative hours by the fireplace that nature invited him to the art of drawing. 
which he began practicing by drawing with coal on the hearth and the chimney. In Farmanda's biography of Reichard, fire once again functions as the catalyst of artistic ingenuity. In Holtius's biography, it caused an accident that physically preconditioned Holtius to become an excellent engraver. And in Reichardt's, it created a new intellectual, mental, and emotional desire seemingly out of, out of nowhere and in the middle of nowhere. Um, that is in a region of the Netherlands where, according to Van Mander, there was no tempting example, as he calls it, that would inspire young men to art. Reichardt was cured from his melancholy when he embraced painting that countered the negative effects of his disabling amputation. According to Hetz Hilderburg, Reichardt grew into a quiet, um, moderate, peace-loving, and pious man who greatly loved Holy Scripture and inner peace, achieving stoic contentment, which his contemporaries typically saw as a desirable quality in an artist that predisposes him to creating good works regardless of his circumstances. Moreover, Reichardt was very much loved and cheerful, often saying, I am rich and prosperous. This pleasant demeanor and universal likability earned him a portrayal as Saint Luke, the patron saint of artists, in Franz Flores's famous painting of approximately 1560. So once again, we see here this connection between artistic genius because this disabled artist is now presented as um, no less than the patron saint of all artists. Um, only at a later age when Reichardt began to lose his sight and his impaired vision led him to apply paint too thickly, did he become moody and discontented, conscious of his inability to paint well. His biography confirms that emotional reactions to disability can shift over the course of life, depending on its specific type and scope. In Karl van Mander's text, melancholy also affected Holtius. Van Mander tells us that Holtius married young, which suggests that he had family obligations that were likely overwhelming at a young age, and which eventually led to depression and even tuberculosis. Holtius' health deteriorated rapidly, he was coughing blood, and no physician could cure him. So don't marry young, that's the lesson here. Um, but once again, in Van Mander's telling, art becomes a priceless medicine as Holtius embarks on a journey to Italy. While travel as such was considered um, at the time a possible treatment for melancholy, it was seeing famous pieces of ancient and Renaissance art and various pranks that Holtius played on fellow artists that cured his depression. Holtius traveled incognito to and across Italy, which allowed him to visit shops that were selling his engravings and listen anonymously what other artists and collectors had to say about them. On one occasion, um, Holtius was even taken for a Dutch cheese merchant, and we learned from Van Mander that he actually um, had, cheese, had a, a cheese shipment from the Netherlands arranged um, to the family of his house, whom they told that he's a cheese merchant. Um, but as delightful as um, these different anecdotes about Holtius's journey are, its account is molded up to something quite serious, namely stories of pilgrims who gradually regained health as they approached the shrine to which they were traveling. And it really is a very common trope of stories in the late Middle Ages about pilgrims um, who go on, who are, for instance, blind, or their family member is blind, and they go on a pilgrimage, and the closer they get to the miraculous image or sculpture they want to see, um, the better they begin to um, see. So admired by both Hotus and Van Mander, Italy becomes a secular destination of a pilgrimage that cures a disease that was beyond medical cure. We can look at this story from two perspectives. Through art, Holtius overcomes a chronic illness, melancholy, but at the same time that melancholy was a necessary precondition of Holtius's potential for virtuosity, invention, and craftsmanship as he returns from Italy with new stylistic and conceptual idea. 
Now, let us consider in more detail one anecdote from Holtius's Italian journey. As I mentioned, Holtius traveled in disguise and was unwilling to reveal his true identity. Now, Holtius traveled with a Dutch friend, Jan Matthijsen, and the two were joined in Rome by a young scholar, Philip van Winchen. And the three men uh, journeyed together from Rome to Naples. Van Winchen had never met Holtzus before, but knew that Holtzus was in Italy and wished to meet him. Jan Matthijsen tried telling Van Winchen that, well, Holtzus is the third guy in their party, but Van Winchen refused to believe it. Holtzus eventually decided that Van Winchen was a good companion and an honorable man, and that he deserved a proper answer. And he held out his crippled right hand and also showed him his handkerchief marked with the monogram which is on his prints, that is H and G intertwined. Van Wilhelm knew about Holtzius's deformity, which of course raises the question why he didn't recognize Holtzius um, sooner, why, and why he stubbornly refused to believe that he was the third man in their party. I would suggest that in Van Mander's account, this delayed recognition serves to underscore that Holtzius remains fully in control of his identity at all times. He manages to deceive fellow painters and collectors by traveling in disguise, and it is he who decides when and how to show Van Wilhelm his crippled hand only in conjunction with his monogrammed handkerchief that unmistakably links him to his engravings. In the moment when he reveals his identity, the, the, that disfigured hand gains its true meaning as an instrument of artistic creation. Now, Holtzius's <coughs> performance of his deformity in the meeting with Van Wilhelm needs to be considered in the broader context of this place of disability and disease in the early modern Netherlands. Um, of course, just like us, people back then would encounter individuals with various impairments in different situations and social contexts within their families, religious congregations, um, neighborhoods, professional guilds. But a, pu but a public performative display of disability was associated with one group of disabled people and one context in particular, namely, beggars occupying public spaces, such as those whom we can see in Peter Bruchel the Elders, the fight between Carnival um, and Land, and I, will, I would like to draw your attention to these two um, details, and let's zoom onto them. Those disabled people who were forced to rely on alms for their livelihood had to navigate contradictory expectations of their potential benefactors. Typically, people with mobility and sensory impairments were considered worthy of public assistance and compassion. But the public display of a disabled body was necessary to remove any doubt that those people were genuinely unable to work. But these, as they were called, unsightly beggars, also provoked the disgust and had been described as subjects since the late Middle Ages. By 1526, their presence was considered disturbing enough for the famous humanist writer Juan Luis Vives to suggest in his book On Assistance to the Poor that beggars should be removed from the streets. It will be safer, healthier, and pleasanter to attend churches and to dwell in the city. The hideousness of ulcers and diseases will no longer be imposed on the general viewing, eliminating a spectacle revolting to nature and even to the most humane and compassionate mind. Incidentally, uh, Vives' proposals to remove um, impaired beggars from the streets of Netherlandish towns is almost identical with the so-called ugly laws that were in place in many American cities between 1867 and 1974 and banned physically disabled people from public spaces. And if this is something of interest to you, there's an excellent book on this topic by Suzanne Schweig, um, The Ugly Laws Disability in Public, where she addresses this 20th century um, and late 19th century American laws. Now, I would like to add for context um, here how we should and shouldn't understand compassion charity within the ethical system of early modern Christianity. 
as it is different than how we think about disability. Compassion was a precondition of actionable virtue of charity and had profoundly positive overtones. It is not equivalent to condescending pity, which we now rightfully reject as um, a reaction to disability. Um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, compassion, activated through the sight of a disabled body, was meant to lead to the religious response of works of mercy listed in the New Testament when Christ says that the kingdom of heaven will belong to those who helped their brothers and sisters in need. And this is a very commonly depicted subject at the time, seven works of mercy, uh, where we also see people who are disabled um, receiving assistance, uh, people visiting those who are sick. Um, but the empathy engendered by disabled bodies was often mixed with the fear, um, excuse me, um, the empathy endured by disabled bodies was often mixed with the fear of unpredictable fate and the possibility that anyone can become disabled and impoverished. This existential uncertainty is expressed in this 1559 print by Philip Schale after Peter Bruchel the Elder. Um, and the inscription at the bottom reads, expect what happens to others to happen to you. You will then and not till then be aroused to offer help only if you make your own the feelings of the man who appeals for help in the midst of adversity. I would argue that when people felt revulsion at the sight of disabled and deformed bodies, they were actually trying to deny the possibility of falling into the same circumstances. Another source of this disgusted rejection of disabled beggars was the pre-modern etiology of impairment. In the Middle Ages and early modernity, people continued to associate disability and disease with moral transgressions and sin. This hyperbolical, hyperbolical association between impairment and moral and religi religious shortcomings is well captured in the engraving published around 1570 by Hieronymus Koch in Antwerp, known under the title Cripples. While physicians and pathologists um, have identified several diseases that cause the types of impairments and deformities captured by the unknown artist, the print and its accompanying inscription were meant to serve as a warning against beggars feigning their impairments, as blue is um, the color of deception in Dutch culture. Um, and it's also meant to serve as a warning against beggars who used to be thieves and lost their legs or arms while serving their prison sentence. That was not uncommon. Ultimately, the print is a deterrent against helping those who did not deserve it or whom we suspect that don't deserve it. Now, let us go back to Holtz's performance of his disability. By activating compensation trope that interprets Holtius's impaired hand as the instrument of artistic excellence, Van Manner and Holtius erase negative emotions typically identified as non-disabled viewers re and witnesses' reactions to disability. For his contemporaries, Holtius, a crippled engraver, must have seemed a curious aberration, what in recent years has been termed a supercrit. Now, a supercrit is an inspiring disabled individual who overcomes their disability and accomplishes things that the non-disabled population considers to be impossible for them to achieve. Instead of pitying a disabled person, we admire their accomplishments. As Eli Clark, Claire excuse me, asserts, the non-disabled world is saturated with super creep stories, such as a blind man hides the Appalachian Trail from end to end. An adolescent girl with Down syndrome learns to drive and has a boyfriend. A guy with one leg runs across Canada. Now to Claire and many disability scholars and activists, such stories, I quote, reinforce the superiority of the non-disabled body and mind, end of quote, largely because they ignore the oppressive socioeconomic and political conditions that make it difficult for people with disabilities to lead ordinary lives. And while this notion of supercrit is often criticized precisely because it erases 
um, difficulties created by non-disabled people for disabled people, and because it tasks disabled individuals with overcoming those difficulties, some people, like Stevie Wonder, for instance, have embraced it. And I would say that Holtz use embraced it too and manipulate um, the supercrypt concept before it was called that way, of course, to his advantage. The process of becoming a supercrypt is thematized um, in one of Holtz's key works, the 1586 engraving of Gaius Mutius Scavola. Um, Scavola, a Roman youth, plotted to assassinate the Etruscan king who invaded Rome. But after mistakenly killing the king's scribe, he was captured. And we can see the body of the dead scribe right here in the background of the image. In the face of imminent danger and death, Scavola put his hand into a flame to show his fearlessness. And we see this scene here. Upon witnessing his self-sacrifice and courage, the Etruscan king spared Scavola's life and his army retreated. So in this ancient story, Scavola transformed the fate of his city and underwent a personal transformation of fire, by fire. This story must have held great appeal to Holtzius, who underwent a similar transformation from um, the hapless toddler injured in, um, in a fire, but then he became this great artist. Now, I would like now to shift our attention to other artists with disabilities and how the compensation and supercrypt tropes play, in, um, their play out in their biographies. Carl von Mander's book on picturing was published in 1604 and so too early to include some of the most famous deaf and mute Dutch painters, among whom we find uh, Henrik Averkamp, Johannes Tophas, Jan Janssen de Stomme, which means the mute, and my personal favorite, Hans Verhagen, um, the Stoma. These late 16th and 17th century painters also had their ancient predecessor, predecessor. Um, Quintus Pedius, likely a great nephew of Julius Caesar, about whom Pliny the Elder wrote in the first century of the common era that he was mute from birth, which means that he was born deaf. It was recommended that Quintus should be brought up as a painter, a proposal which was also approved of by the late Emperor Augustus. Sadly, Pliny tell, tells us, Quintus died in his youth after having made great progress in the art. Writing in the 17th century, another um, Dutch painter, Samuel van Hoogstraten, commented on this ancient story that since then almost all of the mutes among people of distinction have been urged toward the art of painting, just like the blind are commonly considered most suited to music or musical instruments. Van Hoogstraten's observation <coughs> confirms that congenitally that people who became painters typically came from relatively wealthy families, and we indeed see this pattern both in the Netherlands and in Italy. Moreover, these prelingually deaf artists belong to painters' guilds, studied with established masters. There is a possibility that Jan Janssen was actually Rembrandt's apprentice, and their works were widely collected and imitated by other artists. In other words, early modern deaf artists were not self-taught outsiders who doubled in visual arts as a hobby, but participated in the mainstream practices of their profession and the art market. Jan Janssen and Johannes Stoffers created portraits of Dutch um, socioeconomic and political elite, including Niklas Tulp, um, <coughs> whose portrait Johannes Stoffers made around 1660 when um, Niklas Tulp was the mayor of Amsterdam, and I'm sure you all know um, Niklas Stoffers from his earlier career as a surgeon in the famous painting by Rembrandt. That prolingually the painters often created portraits proves that their lack of verbal speech did not preclude their social integration and collaboration with wealthy clients. Some deaf and mute artists became true innovators like Hans Verhagen, who was the first Netherlandish artist to create extremely accurate and really beautiful drawings and gouaches 
of animals, including local European species, as well as an image of an elephant that was brought to Antwerp in 1563. And Henrik Aberkamp, known to his contemporaries as the mute from Kampen, the town where he was born, invented and popularized the quintessentially Dutch type of landscape imagery, lively paintings of winter with people enjoying ice skating in Dutch towns and villages. So what can we as 21st century viewers learn about the experiences of disability, deformity, and deafness among early modern artists, and how can we interpret their lives and careers? When Van Hoogstraten says that almost all of the mutes among people of distinction have been urged toward the art of painting, he acknowledges that there is a common expectation among his contemporaries that the sense of sight in people who are born deaf would be heightened. Now, in 20th and 21st century scholarship, Henrik Averkamp's talent was often ascribed to his sense of observation being heightened in the absence of hearing. Similarly, the 2014 exhibition organized in one of Amsterdam museums dedicated to Johannes Topas proposed that some of Topas's works could have only been created in silence to the exclusion of everything else and argued that the absence of audible distractions helped Topas create his timeless portraits. Unfortunately, we do not know whether Topas indeed experienced his deafness that way. Few early modern documents authored by people with disabilities exist, and to the best of my knowledge, none of the congenitally deaf Dutch painters have left any written records. Among the few early modern documents written by deaf and disabled individuals that we know of, some suggest that individuals who experience hearing loss or another kind of disability later in life perceived it as isolating. Um, some would grow to resent their relative stubborn search for a cure, and this is actually a very common phenomenon among people with disabilities nowadays, while others benefited from the opportunities offered by access to deaf education and opportunities to establish professional careers. So as trivial as it sounds, when we think about history of disability and deafness, we should not be imagining some like generic disabled or deaf individual but rather consider diversity of experiences of disabled and deaf people in the 1600s. Now, what I find really interesting is that in contemporary popular culture, the ubiquitous presence of the compensation narrative, and think again about Daredevil, Stephen Hawking, um, Stevie Wonder, has been actually shown to provide a self-enhancement mechanism for individual, individuals with sensory impairment. Um, so in psychological studies, um, deaf people tend to rate their intact senses as more sensitive than hearing controls, even when no such difference is observed in measurable screening tests. So in other words, a lot of deaf people would indicate that their um, vision is better um, than the vision of people who's, uh, who have intact hearing. And the same results have been observed in visually impaired individuals with their hearing. So it is possible that this idea, which as we have seen existed since antiquity, offered a similar empowering mechanism to deaf painters already in the 17th century. These compensation narratives are then deeply ambivalent. On the one hand, they, I think, perpetuate ableism as when we use deafness to explain the extraordinary visual talent and skills of someone like Johannes Topas, and when nowadays educators expect all deaf students to be to have heightened visual perception, which is extremely common among teachers who don't have special education training. On the other hand, as psychology research on self-enhancement mechanism that I cited and testimonies of some members of contemporary deaf communities show those narratives can have a positive effect on identity and professional identity formation among deaf and disabled individuals. And again, some people, some celebrities embrace them. In the end, I believe the lessons, the lives and careers 
Um, I'll, I'll just introduce here Paul II, Streichardt, Verpach and Stomme, Averkamp, um, Topaz. Teach us is that contrary to what modern audiences often expect, physical and sensory disabilities do not exist on the fringes of history of art, but at its center. A centuries old text developed an intrinsic connection between disability and artistic genius. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kaminska, I know uh, we're about out of time, but uh, maybe we could take like five minutes for questions, if you uh, don't mind sticking around for a couple minutes. Uh, feel free if you have any uh, questions, comments for our speaker. I'm sure she would love to answer. <laughs> yeah, Chrissy. Chrissy. Barbara, I just find this totally fascinating. So first of all, thank you so much mm -hmm. for sharing your work with us. Um, I was wondering about, uh, there's sort of a, a sense in which the disabled body part becomes an identity marker, right? Um, and so I was wondering, like, with the whole story about Goldtooth hands, about ha ha, I'm Goldtooth, you know, like, and yeah. I, I mean, particularly, I guess I'm like, sort of fascinated with this Richard painting, right? Because the ox, St. Luke, is like, mm -hmm. protecting the leg, and I'm not sure yeah. which leg, like, I don't know which leg he lost. Okay, we don't know. Yeah. I mean, he, he must have lost his right leg because it was amputated. So we are seeing his left leg protected, right. which, yeah, I think it's a fascinating observation that the left leg, intact leg, is protected by the yeah, arts. I, I was just wondering, like, especially with this, like, when we see these, like, St. Luke paintings, we expect him to be painting the Madonna, right? Yes. So he's, like, kind of looking down and content. I mean, this sort of, like, squares with Van Manders. Mm -hmm description of him. I, I guess this whole thing was like, oh, these really are identity markers. And mm -hmm. I, I was wondering with the, the other artists that were just dis disabled, you don't get those kind of identity markers at all. Uh, or And are they signed? Do they value them more? Yeah. Like, how, like, what so is the... That is, that is a really great question. So, the only, um, well, so quotes you made several self-portraits. Um, the only other artists, and we see like scarring to the hand in all of them, the only other artist about whom we know that he made self-portraits uh, was Jan Janssen de Stomme, and this is one of the two self-portraits. The other one is identical except that it's full length, but it's, it's, and they were made in the same year. Um, it's unfortunately, they are in very poor state, I guess they, weren't really considered for a long time worthy of renovation, really. Um, but they are signed, and one of them, I mean, I really can see it, but this one also gives the age of the artist. Um, now, there is, so there is nothing in Jan Jansson's uh, biographies written by his contemporaries, and he was sort of a celebrity, I would say, among his contemporaries that would indicate that he could read and write. And it's actually a lot of his biograph biographers say that first his um, sister and later in life his wife um, would um, read to him and they um, communicated in a sign language. So it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, what likely is the case here is that um, Jansson was just able you know, to like paint his signature um, but that's about it. We also, um, and I think this kind of goes along your question, I was also really curious when doing this research, what contemporary collectors thought of them? Like, was it like intriguing to have a work by a deaf and mute or otherwise disabled artist? Um, and with the exception of Holtzius, where it was like fascinating to his contemporaries, we don't really see it. So it really seems like, even though there was a lot of bias, especially against people who were, who liked verbal speech, it seemed like it really wasn't like such a big deal in everyday life. I mean, sure, people would notice those things, but they were perfectly capable to work with elite clients. Does this answer? Yeah, <laughs> like because you hear, you know, women artists are like marbles and freaks. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a great point. 
Any other questions? Maybe one more? Margarita? So what got you started to investigate in this topic? Uh, what made me start to investigate this topic? So um, when I was finishing my second book, which let me actually go back to one of these images, in which I was very much interested in the iconography of the seven works of mercy, um, and also in images that showed biblical episodes of Christ healing people. And this was really a, a project about like changes in religion, um, understanding of miracles, stuff like that. Um, I started thinking about, okay, but what does it actually tell us about people's approaches to disability? And that eventually led me um, to thinking, were there actually others who had some sort of disability? Um, and I started finding out about all these deaf and mute artists. And I came initially to that project with a lot of um, expectations, like popular culture teaches us that, you know, oh, you know, like there are those disabled artists who um, just function on the fringes of the society and the art market, they are self-taught outsiders. And as I was digging deeper, I found it really fascinating that it's absolutely not a pattern in the 16th and 17th centuries that they are really within, um, within the mainstream. And I, I think it's very important for us to understand it, to have this kind of like corrected view of art history um, and its relationship with, um, with disability, that it was something not just within the reach of um, disabled people at the time, but that those narratives, when you look for them, um, you really find disability at the very center of art historical um, discussions, theories, and I, I find this to be really fascinating and also probably one of the biggest, um, I was about to say blind spots, it's a terrible expression mm -hmm. to use in this context, but I can't think of any better, but it's like a, it's a terrible, you know, gap that we have in, in our history. All right, well, I think that brings us to time, but if you want to come up and ask yeah, any questions, questions, feel free to. Thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, just one more round of applause for everyone. <laughs>